everybody, and welcome back to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, and the Force is still strong with Respawn Entertainment. In episode 318 today, May 20th, 2023. In fact, may I give all of you a belated May the 4th be with you, even though it's 16 days later at this recording. But you know what? I say the whole month should be, uh, you know, filled with Star Wars goodness, so... I'm not ashamed. Anyway, our topic of the day is Star Wars Jedi Survivor gameplay impressions. So there's no need to skip ahead whatsoever. And just so you are all aware, I have decided to not dive into the major spoilers for this game, just because the game itself is still brand new. I will be probably talking about some more of the minor spoilers, but nothing huge in terms of like the big plot twists and so forth. So yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it if I were you, if you haven't played the game yet. Anywho, yes, this is a game I've been looking forward to playing for a long time. Essentially, once I beat the first game, the Star Wars uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Oh my goodness. That was a fabulous game. Fabulous game indeed. And so here we are, several years later, with the much anticipated sequel. And I gotta say, right out the gate, congratulations to the team over at Respawn Entertainment. It truly is a spectacle to see how you all are able to create this type of game in a world such as Star Wars, which is not, in my opinion, an easy thing to do. And you guys really did. I mean, it, it was really impressive to see not only what you did in the first title, but in the second title. I actually have a couple of friends who uh, who worked on the, the game itself. One is Scott Russell. The other is Brian West. So I salute you two gentlemen and uh, cannot wait to be able to hear more about the journey that not only you two went on, but also the, the team as a whole. I think it's it's such a time for celebration, so you've earned it. Now, where to begin with my impressions of the game? I say, let's start with the graphics. Now, the graphics is something that, even in the first title, was very impressive. I remember seeing Cal Kestis and he was in um, the, kind of like that, that ship junkyard area where there were all kinds of uh, decommissioned Star Destroyers and, and other huge ships that were being slowly but surely torn apart. And even back then, I was really blown away by the, the production value of what I was seeing. Just, just this graphical tour de force where they really wanted to impress all of us immediately out the gate. And this is no different that you, you can tell like they they basically figured out what they wanted to do in the first title and this title is them just running with it like they, they want to make it bigger better more epic so it is definitely a feast for the eyes the next generation consoles also really shine with this where you have a lot of atmosphere a lot of uh, the ray tracing reflections even the, the shadow work and, and uh, the architecture itself is extremely well done. The environments, I would say, once again, and we're seeing this pattern, which is a great pattern with a lot of these, these newer titles that are coming out, but the, the environments are just breathtaking. There's like this fantastic sense of verticality that you see time and time again, whether you're looking over like a, a cliff and you're seeing this huge ravine down below you, or perhaps you're up on some kind of space station and you're just looking out at the kind of the asteroid vista, whatever it may be, the environments themselves are a thing of beauty. I, I really, I, and I think too, because it is Star Wars, Star Wars has a very specific art direction. And that's no surprise to anyone, but I think it is a unique challenge when you're trying to conjure up these original places that George Lucas never actually conjured up in his films. And so I think when it comes to this game, they really did a fine job with all these different environments. I, I found myself completely embracing each one of these environments I was in. I had a lot of fun just frolicking. That's right. I frolicked through multiple environments and 
I mean, I love going into the, the little caves and tunnels, and especially when, when you ignite your lightsaber and that glow that happens. You can use your, your lightsaber as a flashlight if you need to. The whole thing is so satisfying as a big Star Wars fan, uh, just, just visually speaking. The one critique I do have visually is, so one of the, the main characters in this game, uh, you, you eventually come across, his name is Dagon. It's either Dagon or Dagon. I'm pretty sure it's Dagon though. <laughs> I'm still I'm still having to try and memorize all these, these uh, character names. Not gonna lie, when I first came across Dagon, I got a little bit of the Sephiroth vibes from Final Fantasy VII in the sense that he's, when you first come across him, and again, this is not a major spoiler. This is in fact something that they advertised with the game. I believe it like, it was either last year's E3 or maybe it was like the Game Award, maybe it was the Game Awards. But they had like this whole setup of this, this uh, Bacta tank with this character that was floating in there, had an arm missing, long hair, and when I came across that character in the game, for some reason, I just thought of the cinematics from Final Fantasy VII when Cloud comes up and, and sees Sephiroth. And I want to say that Sephiroth was in a similar situation where he was in kind of a, a vat. He was like floating in some kind of t huge test tube or whatever. Anyway, not a big deal, but just one of those things that kind of like harkened back to uh, some of the, the game playing goodness of the, the mid 90s. Now, moving beyond that with the same character, I wasn't as on board with the art direction of his look. Now, I'm, I'm fairly certain that whoever the, the person was who did the performance for Dagon, they may have used his likeness in terms of his face. And I'm not talking about that. And also, I'm not talking about the performance because I did like the performance. I think in terms of his overall look, he, and I'm just being totally honest, he kind of reminded me a little bit of Lord of the Rings, specifically the elves. Like he had kind of that elf garb that he was wearing. And then not only that, but um, the hairstyle and... I would even say the face. And again, I don't know if this is based, if the, the character face is based off an actual actor. And if it is, it has nothing to do with like, you know, thinking the actor doesn't look good or whatever. But, it, you know, when, you, when you're casting for various types of, of uh, movies or stories or genres or IPs in this instance, then I think it's important to be mindful of, okay, we, you know, if, if there's a, a candidate that you're looking at and you're thinking we, this person may actually fit this particular character that we have in mind really, really well, I would encourage those to just moving forward, look at the, the, just the overall aesthetic. Like, like, does this person look like a Star Wars character or does it look like a character that belongs in Lord of the Rings? Does it look like a character from Star Trek? Does it look like a character from... You know, name your name your pick. Like, you, I think that there are um, very specific components, visual components that need to be just mindful. Like when you when you when you're considering these decisions. Again, not a huge deal, but it is just something that, as I was playing it and and as I got to know the character a bit more and just watching the character, I was like, man, this is. I feel like this is one of like the the elder elves from Lord of the Rings. And, you know, just again, only visually speaking, his persona was terrific in terms of him being like a within the Star Wars universe. That totally works. So anyway, take that for what it's worth. A little food for thought, a little critique on the, the uh, visual side. Now, in terms of the audio, oh my goodness, the audio in this game is also just divine. It's fantastic. I don't know at the time of this recording, whether or not they simply just took various riffs from John Williams from all the different films that he's done in the past, or if they had certain um, composers who were, you know, they, they were looking at what John Williams did and then create their own riffs off of what John Williams' previous works consisted of. 
whatever the case may be, the music in this game is some of the best Star Wars music I have witnessed both in the films, but also in any kind of Star Wars game. And that's saying a lot just because in this game, and I've, I've actually made my way, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing I'm probably 75%, 80% of the way through the game. So I've been able to hear quite a bit of, of what they have. And they don't rely on kind of the, the tried and true main themes that you would hear. Like if you were to watch like um, episodes four, five, and six, for example, there were like these definite iconic themes that John Williams did for these various characters. You don't really hear any of that in this game. And I think that that, that unto itself is a, a wonderful challenge because like when you're going through the game, it, does, it doesn't matter where I am currently where like I could be going through a desert area or I could be making my way through kind of like this uh, uh, corridor of, of, you know, consisting of lots of chasms and whatnot, or maybe I'm in outer space or maybe I'm on Coruscant. The point is, is that every, t like every step of the way that I'm going, I am really floored over how well the music matches the current situation. If that makes any sense. Like I could be walking through just a, a little portion of say Coruscant. And then I turn a corner and I see another part of the environment and I'm making my way through uh, different adversaries and whatnot. And the music tone will shift and will totally match what I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing on screen. So again, kudos to whoever was in charge of the music itself. Cause I, I was just, I was, there were so many times I was grinning as I was playing this game, just based off of what the music was doing in relation to what was happening to me. Really, really well done. In terms of, of critiquing, so the VO in this game is a bit of a mixed bag. I do think the main characters like Cal Kestis, uh, I mean, BD's not really a voiceover, it's a lot of bleeps and bloops, but I'll, I'll throw BD in there. But Dagon, uh, Grease, all these different characters that you come across, those all sound great. They sound fine. The issue that I have, the note that I want to submit to Respawn is all of the NPCs that you come across throughout the different planets. I had a problem with the accents. And more specifically, when I would talk to various NPCs in order to find out like what kind of side quests or, or they call it in this game, they call it rumors. You know, when I'm conversing with these different alien types, First of all, they're speaking English, which I think is a mistake in my opinion. This is just one man's opinion, but I feel like when I, when I watch the Star Wars movies, especially the OG trilogy, I would say most of the aliens that, that we would watch Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Han Solo interact with had their own alien language. And then you had the, the subtitles below so you could see what it was that they were saying. To me, that felt like a much more authentic experience when I'm in a galaxy far, far away. And these are these, these alien species that clearly have not been born and raised on earth. And so therefore English is not their first language. Now you can have certain aliens that perhaps can speak English as a second language, maybe like some of the, the English language patterns are broken because they don't know all the, the intricacies of our language. But at the same time, my first, I don't know, my, my first preference would be to actually have them speak different types of languages. So like, you know, again, if you think about like say Chewbacca, right? Chewie doesn't speak English. If you think of the Jawas, the Jawas don't speak English. The Ewoks don't speak English. Even when Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi go into Moss Eisley spaceport, you saw all kinds of different alien creatures not speaking English, but they had subtitles. In fact, there was only one humanoid creature who did speak English, which was the famous, he doesn't like you. 
I don't like you either. You know, that whole exchange that was going on. But when you think of, of the sheer amount, even some of the droids, like in Empire Strikes Back, when C-3PO sees another unit that looks like him, you, you, the, the droid looks at him and says, hey, Chuta. He goes, oh, how rude. You know, so again, that to me makes the experience more exotic. It makes it more authentic because I, as an earthling, as a human who speaks English, I have no idea like what's being said, but I buy into it even more as a result. So what happens is, is that in, in uh, Jedi Survivor, I came across NPCs that would have Southern accents. They would have Hispanic accents. One had a Scottish accent. And so those are things that for me, it's like, it doesn't work. Now, there is a caveat to that. And that is that if you have, say, for instance, human characters that are part of the crew who happen to have those types of accents, I think I would buy into that more because it just visually speaking, it makes sense. They, they are human beings and therefore um, those types of accents are what I'm used to. But again, it goes back to what I was talking about, how this is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Those are the very first words that come on screen for every Star Wars movie, which helps to wipe the slate clean, right? You, they, they were wanting to be very intentional with giving us a blank canvas so that there are no references to Earth whatsoever. So again, a critique in terms of the audio itself, it's, it's by no means a huge deal, but I did find, and I think, I think this is actually a testament to how amazing this game is, is that because all the other parts of this game are exquisite, those little parts that I found to be a little weaker stood out a bit more. But again, it's not like a deal breaker. It's not like it ruined the experience or whatever. It's just, oh my goodness, if those things would have been addressed and approached differently, it would have even elevated this, this game, this already amazing game even higher. I want to pivot away from that and talk about the, the gameplay mechanics of this game. So what's nice is, is that they took what we experienced in the first title and then built off of that in this one. So it's not like we're having to start over or reset, which I think was a very wise decision. I think it was really good to be able to say, okay, we know that these players and the character of Cal has gone through rediscovering himself as a Jedi, rediscovering all these different abilities. And as a result, let's dive down that rabbit hole deeper. Like what other kind of abilities can he learn now that he's gotten back in touch with the force? I think that that's absolutely terrific. So in this game, they have uh, something similar where like they have these meditation spots and within those meditation spots, you can sit down and look at these ability trees, which was pretty similar to the first game itself. And in this one, they have broken it up into three main sections. One is survival. Another one is lightsaber. And the third is the force. And so what's really cool is it, it takes you on a bit of uh, kind of a node journey, if you will, where you have a bunch of these little icons that are in these circles. And then you, as you level up and unlock more ability points can then, or I, I don't know if they're, if they're referred to as ability points or skill points. I think it's skill points in the game. But as you accumulate these, then you can actually apply them to these different abilities to help upgrade your character. Again, this was another feature from the first game that I really approve of. I think it is terrific. And it's no different here because now they've expanded, especially the, the lightsaber portion, which I'm really excited about, into where you as a player can customize how, you, how your fighting style is ultimately going to be in the game. So what's really cool is they have like the, the tried and true, you know, your single lightsaber. Can't go wrong with that. It's, it's probably the most balanced out of all the different fighting styles. Then you have your dual wielding, which is also really satisfying, having a lightsaber in each hand. You have the, the double-sided lightsaber. And then you have this other one, I think, I think they call it cross guard. I don't know if there are any others in the game, but those are the ones that I've unlocked. And they each have a very different feeling in terms of how you wield those fighting styles in combat. 
my personal preference as of right now, I would say is the double-sided lightsaber for getting into uh, crowd control and defensive stances. And then using the, that's either cross guard or cross bar. I want to say cross guard. But I use that for when I get into single encounters, especially like with boss fights and whatnot, because it's just, it's really fun to wield. Uh, it definitely takes uh, a different technique overall in order to be successful with it. And also the brilliance of this system is that it doesn't force you to have to just commit to specific fighting styles. Like if you want to test one out for a while and you think, okay, well, I'm kind of satisfied with this, but I kind of want to try some of these other ones and, and just figure out what flows the best with my play style. You can totally do that. What's really nice too, is they have an option for you to reset, excuse me, all of your skill points and then reassign them to different abilities as you see fit. So really, really thoughtful process with, with how a lot of this stuff works out. On top of that, you have the force. So the force has expanded. Well, I mean, it, it, some of them are, is the same as the first game, but they, they have expanded upon that. So as you go along upgrading your, your abilities, you have the force push, you have the force pull, you have force lift, so you can lift someone in the air. You have the force slam, you can slam people onto the ground. You have also the ability to upgrade those into more like larger radius type of effects. So like instead of having just one person that you're lifting up in the air, if you fully upgrade that path, you can lift up like five stormtroopers in the air, which I'm not gonna lie, like that that makes you feel pretty badass. Like you're you're super powerful. You're feeling kind of Jedi mastery, if you will. And also too, like if you're being overwhelmed, it's such a, a great defensive tactic to be able to catch a breath, maybe use a, a a stem pack to heal yourself, just kind of reposition yourself and, and gain that situational awareness. So that's all really well and good. Also, the, there's some of the telekinesis that they've been doing that kind of is a cousin to what I was describing where, where you can have certain objects that you need to use for puzzles in the game. And so you're, you're utilizing your, your force skills and talents on that. I want to say there was something else that I wrote down with it. Oh, confuse. So confuse is also another really fun force ability where you can apply that to say one enemy or if you upgrade it, you can apply it to at least two. I think, I don't know if you can do more than two, but that is super fun as well. Like as you encounter different types of foes, just to see like, how is this going to work out? How is, how, if, if I have this character confused over here, how will that aid me in fighting? And let me tell you, like when you upgrade that and you start confusing like the large monsters that yes, there are huge monsters in this game. It is a thing of beauty to watch them <laughs> start fighting for you on a temporary basis. Super, super cool. I would like to also talk about the the saloon itself. So Grease, and this is this is not really a spoiler because this is early on in the game. You will find that Grease has become the owner of a, a certain saloon on one of the planets. And really, it becomes kind of a base of operations, if you will, for the majority of the game. What I like about it is how it's not just wallpaper. It's not just set dressing for you to like, oh, okay, this is kind of where I can go and talk to the different members of my crew. Instead, you actually have the option to be able to go out and explore. And as you meet different people or different, different characters in the game, you can befriend quite a few of them and you'll find them back hanging out at the saloon, which is cool because when you first get to the saloon, it's kind of a ghost town. It's very empty. There's only maybe one or two people that are hanging out. It doesn't seem like it's as much of a party. And yet one of the small rewards the game gives you is as you go around and you talk to more of the townsfolk or you, you encounter different people or creatures, there are a number of them that will come back. And not only that, they'll also kind of help you spruce up the place. So you have like one character. And again, I don't remember all the names, but like Scuva is one. He's the one who has a Scottish accent. So he's this like 
expert scuba diver and he you, you can find him at random locations throughout the planet like basically if, if you see an area that has lots of water chances are he'll probably be there and so then you can talk to him and he has all these like crazy outlandish stories he likes to tell you and on top of that he will go diving for various exotic fish what's cool about it is that in the saloon the saloon itself has this massive aquarium on the second floor of the building and every fish that he catches he will bring back to the saloon and so then this aquarium all of a sudden is becoming more and more teeming with life and again not a huge deal but it's like these nice little touches that the team made where it's like okay if we're gonna have a saloon what are different ways that we can kind of bring it to life a bit more another example is i came across another creature and i can't i can't remember the name of this one but they allow you to uh, find different types of seeds, different plant seeds throughout the planets. And you can bring them back and go on the roof of the saloon and be able to plant different types of uh, <laughs> alien species of plants. I, and for, for me, I actually am a bit of a late bloomer, as it were. That pun was intended. When it comes to this, just because I wasn't sure how to collect the seeds. And now I understand, oh, okay, so basically I have to use my lightsaber and, and slash around like a fool whenever I see a bunch of foliage. And then I'll be able to, to I would say more often than not, be able to collect these different seeds, bring them back and implant it and so forth. I don't know if there is anything to gain from the plants or if it's simply just kind of like this aesthetic for the saloon. So like if you go up and you want to have your own alien Zen garden of sorts, I, I honestly don't know. I haven't gotten that far in the game. I don't know if there are any kinds of uh, medicinal purposes as the plants mature or if they yield any other type of uh, gameplay attributes. I have no idea. But again, it's just, it's fun to be able to kind of customize you know, the, the, the roof of the saloon. And then the, like another example is uh, I've been able to collect different types of music. At this point of playing, at, like at, at this recording, or I should say as of this recording, um, I don't know how to actually get the, the tracks to play there are clearly albums that you can buy and on my understanding is there should be some way to play them at the saloon i haven't figured out how to do that i don't see some alien version of a jukebox or anything like that there is a stage that looks like a band is supposed to play on it or a dj something like that but i i guess i have not found that particular npc yet for them to come back and liven up the place a bit i'm not exactly sure but yet yeah, that's another example of where like yeah like i i think it'd be fun to be able to grab these tracks and, and see what happens be able to you know fully have uh creative reign over this saloon so that, that's that's always uh just i don't know i, I enjoy the, those little bits of, of thoughtfulness into the game itself the story my goodness, we haven't talked about the narrative on this yet. So the story continues where the, the previous game left off. And I'm not going to go into detail about this just because this is a single player narrative. One of the, the biggest gifts of this game is the story itself. So I'm going to be intentionally vague just because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But I can tell you what I've seen up until this point very satisfying honestly i kind of wish that some of the newer star wars movies had a narrative like this because i'm buying into it i love how you have more characters that are built upon the pre-existing ones they didn't ditch any of the older characters from the first game which was great because one of the notes i had from the first title was that by the time I started feeling a bond with my crew, the game ended. And so it makes me really happy as I play this game where, where the crew is still very much in the game. It, they're, they're not necessarily together at first, but then you know, after a short playthrough, 
you encounter them, you're able to talk with them, they help you, so forth. And so that's that's very satisfying to me because it's like, okay, great. So we're not, it's not like a one and done kind of thing. This is a sequel in all senses of the word. And that allows me to continue bonding with these heroes as well as perhaps some, some new characters along the way. I want to be able to talk about certain things so badly, but I'm going to exercise some self-control because I just... Mm, I think what's going to save me is, is if I go back to graphics really quickly. There is a particular place. Uh, I don't remember what it's called exactly. This is later on in the game. This is not a spoiler. But it's it, there. there is this location that's up in the sky. And it's kind of like this observation facility of sorts. That is probably one of my favorite environments out of the entire game. As I was running through that, I was floored over the sheer visual. I mean, to give you an idea, so it's it's in the sky. I'll, I'll give you that much information on it. And the traversal system in this game is also a blast, which we haven't talked about yet. So in the first game, if you've played it, you'll remember how Cal has a certain amount of nimbleness to how he gets around, how he moves, that sort of thing. And they continue that into this game. They, they've actually incorporated a, a grappling hook, which I don't think he had in the first game. There are different types of other jumping abilities that I don't think he had in the first game. And so being that high up, taking these daredevil chances that I was taking, it was so satisfying because like the camera would kind of subtly shake a little bit and his hair's blowing all wildly because we're so high up and there are TIE fighters that are flying overhead and my palms literally got sweaty as I was playing on this particular observation deck because I was so afraid of falling. I mean, the, the, the presentation of feeling like, yeah, you're, you are so high up, but the cloud layer is actually below you and you're having to figure out how on earth do I make it to the top of this building? Not only does the building look something straight out of like one of the, the movies from the original trilogy, but also the sensation of how you feel as you're up there. It's not just like, oh, I'm playing through this part now. I'm going to make my way through it. It's like, I was really just like kind of feeling the heartbeat palpitate a little bit at times, having the, the sweaty palms as I'm trying to make some death defying leap. Well done. Very well done indeed. But yeah, the, the cow traversal system is also worthy of note where as you go through these different planets, um, the game totally encourages you to want to be as nimble and athletic as possible. And it's, it's just terrific where you're able to scale up the sides of like some uh, metal grating kind of in the first game, or maybe you'll see some vines that you can grab and you can, you know, you'll see some on the ceiling and you're kind of doing the monkey bar thing or you can do a double jump or later on in the game, you can even do like kind of a force dash and you can combine some of these into like a kind of an ongoing thing to get as much distance as possible in the air before you drop. Really, really satisfying. Another aspect of this game that's really cool too is the customization of the characters. So as Cal and as BD, they have all kinds of cosmetics that are strewn throughout these different planets that you can find along the way. And, and they're not necessary in order to complete the story, but they are these little bits of loot that you find that, that spur you forward because a lot of this game, well, if you think about the game loop, the game loop is basically search and discovery. Then you have combat and then you upgrade your character. And so it's kind of like that that cycle, right? That loop that goes on. And then as you upgrade your character, you are able to search and discover more parts of any given planet, which then leads to more fighting and combat, which then gives you more experience and skill points that then you can upgrade your character more. And the character customization is super fun because like with Cal, I mean, they have, they have a, a lot of different outfits that you can find and choose from. 
and the outfit is not something that's uniform from head to toe. Like if you want to just change up the shirt versus the jacket versus the pants, you can do so. If you want to change up your lightsaber parts, I mean, every component of a lightsaber can be swapped in and out. The, the color of your lightsaber uh, can be swapped out at any time. Even the sound that the lightsaber makes based off the color has an exclusive sound to each color. That it's just it's terrific. When you think of the the portrait of Cal, my goodness, like you can there are all kinds of hairstyles that are available and facial hair that you can choose from. I mean, they've got like <laughs> they've got like the flavor saver soul patch you can put on there. They've got like the trucker stash. They've got the Obi-Wan Kenobi-ish thick beard you can put on there or if you wanted more of like kind of the <laughs> 70s thinner mustache or something I don't know just the the peach fuzz above the lip they have all kinds of different options which are just fun and some are so intentionally ridiculous in a terrific way it's not it doesn't take away from the game at all I think for me as I'm playing through this first time I chose a clean shaven look but I also put on more of a shaggy long haired style just because I just, I love, I, for me, Star Wars is always perpetually in kind of that late seventies, early eighties lifestyle or art, maybe lifestyle is the wrong way for it, but like the art direction that they took with that original trilogy is something that I've always cherished. And I always want to make it as part of any kind of other, uh, you know, future Star Wars encounter. And so I, I definitely went with kind of that eh, somewhat Luke Skywalker shaggy hair from the late seventies kind of look. And in, in, in my opinion, I mean, I just think it looks legit. It, it definitely adds to the overall aesthetic as, as I'm playing the game, but I am totally going to play on my second playthrough. I'm going to make my character look as off the wall, ridiculous as I possibly can, because it is awesome. It is is so I mean I laughed more than one time to see that. And BD is no different. Like BD has so many options when it comes to like the face plate, you can swap in and out, the legs, uh, the torso area. And then honestly, from a, a UI UX perspective, it's really user friendly. I mean, you, you're literally using the D-pad to go left or right, and you see these, these parts that just kind of snap into place. Like, as you go, you can go up, 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 or you go down, 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 down. You can even rotate the parts to kind of get a better idea of what it looks like. I don't know if you can necessarily do that with BD. And I know that for Cal, you have to rotate the whole character model in order to see just how, like, certain things look. But the lightsaber, you can do that with every little part. You can rotate it and get a good idea of how it looks and preview. So that's, uh, that's a lot of fun indeed. So many options. That's a very good thing. It's so fun. It's so exciting. I mean, the colors too, you can decide like how much wear and tear you want on BD or on your lightsaber or yeah, really, really fun indeed. Let me check and see if I'm forgetting anything else because I've been a uh, chatty Kathy this entire show. But I think I've been pretty good at covering just about everything here. Yeah. So I guess I can wrap up by saying I am so happy that this game came out. I'm having a blast playing it. Can't wait to see how the game ends. And honestly, I look forward to seeing what Respawn has planned for a third game because my goodness, like they can't just stop with these two titles. Like they need to have a third and fourth and fifth and sixth. Respawn has done something that is so difficult to do, which is when it comes to Star Wars, there is, and I, I've, I've, I'm, I know I sound like a broken record because I've, I've brought this up many times in the past on the show, but Star Wars has a very specific formula that you have to respect and adhere to. If you stray too much or deviate too much from that formula, it no longer feels like Star Wars. And so we've had, like, especially in film, we've had certain directors who have made creative decisions that ultimately doesn't feel like Star Wars in the end. Like as, as an end moviegoer, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm like, this, 
this doesn't feel like Star Wars. To give you an idea, like a, a more recent example, Mandalorian, I'm, I'm a big fan of the show. However, in the third season, the second half of the third season really lost me because of some of the creative decisions that were made. One of which was having Jack Black in the one in one of the episodes. I love me some Jack Black. I'm a big fan of Jack Black. I have nothing against Jack Black. However, from a creative making decision standpoint, Jack Black has too strong of a personal brand that does not work in the Star Wars world. And so he should not have been cast in The Mandalorian. And I understand, you know, he likes Star Wars. He's funny, all these different things. But again, you know, it doesn't matter if it's like, say, for instance, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise has no business being in a Star Wars movie. Robert Downey Jr. has no business being in a Star Wars movie. The reason being is that they have these very strong personal brands that they have cultivated over the decades and is ultimately what gets butts in seats. However, when it comes to Star Wars, part of the secret sauce is casting unknowns or maybe largely unknowns. You can kind of bend the rules a little bit. Like I do think Benicio Del Toro, for example, he was actually one of my favorite characters from episode seven, eight, nine. And I've always been a big fan of Benicio Del Toro as well, outside of Star Wars, but he is an actor that you don't see a lot of that does not necessarily have a, a very strong personal brand that he projects, which is actually a very good thing unto itself because it makes him more of a chameleon actor that way. And I've always loved everything he's done. So that's kind of what I'm talking about with regards to staying within that formula. And I think that Respawn has done just a masterful job of making me as a gamer feel like I am once again in this Star Wars experience from my childhood. And that's a very difficult thing. Like it is not easy to do that. But I mean, every little bit, whether it's the atmosphere, the music cues, the art direction of the characters, the story itself, all of this comes together to form what, in my view, is one of the best games of the year. And I haven't beaten the game yet. So there you have it. That wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out Patreon dot com slash joygasm where you can enjoy exclusive perks and early access to the show not to mention it continues to financially help me do the podcast also click on that subscribe button as well as that notification bell that way you will not miss a single solitary episode of joygasm it drops once a week each week and you could do a search for joygasm tv spelled j-o-y-g-a-s-m tv on your favorite social media platform of choice if you are so inclined to be able to hang out and see some of the geek nonsense goodness that I post from time to time. Last but not least, do a search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see me stream my video game adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. I thank you for hanging out with me for this long, and I look forward to hanging out with you even more next week.